you know, so hopefully you guys can bear with me. This morning, um, the title of my sermon is The Creator and His Creation. Is it possible I could get lights? Lights, camera, action. Lights? No. <laughs> no, wrong way. I thought my clap on button was broken. <laughs> anyway, the title of my sermon, like I said, is The Creator and His Creation. It's probably a safe statement to say that every culture throughout history has had a God. And there is, when you look at it, even two extremes. On one extreme, the Hindu religion has over a million gods. On the other extreme, a poll that was taken by something called the Eurobarometer um, said that only 14% of Swedish citizens believe there is a God. The other 86% of Swedish citizens are atheists or agnostics. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Out of all the gods known to man, one God always stands out. And this God has an intent, he has intentionally written down who he is, and he's also written down his creation. He is the only God who's given us a book to understand basically life. This unique book even lets God's creation in on his plans, on his desires, and it shares what our Creator is like. So who is this God? Well, let's find out more about him. For thousands of years, Abraham, uh, to the beginning of the church age, God's people, Israel, have known God by this name in Hebrew. The transliteration is Y, it's always a capital, capital Y, capital H, capital W, and capital H. It is found 6,823 times in the Old Testament. Since ancient Hebrew had no written vowels, for centuries it was uncertain how the name was pronounced originally. Records came of the name through, were found through old Greek manuscripts, which did have written vowels. These records indicate that in all likelihood the name should be pronounced Yahweh, or Yohawah. Hey, it was always rendered in all caps. Shortly before the first century AD, uh, it became common for Jews to avoid saying this name at all for fear of misusing it. The Jews, in their fear of this name, were afraid that they could use it, you know, uh, profanely. When reading scripture aloud, they would substitute the word Yahweh for Adonai. Exodus 20, verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Which, is, by the way, is the third commandment, as we know, if you're a believer. But boy, what a difference 2,000 years makes, huh? Can you imagine they were so afraid of misusing God's name, they wouldn't even speak it. Today, people say Jesus Christ, they say oh, God, they say the GD version, they even put it in the text, OMG. I always text it, O capital O, capital M, and then a lowercase g with goodness, oh my goodness. But anyway, that's just me. Um, this uh, name, Yahweh, is his proper name, and it literally means self-existence. He is not dependent on anything. We, though we need God, uh, people get affected mentally, especially when they're alone for great periods of time. Like when you're on a desert island for three years and you name your favorite volleyball, Wilson, and you start having arguments with him. I am telling them the story. Just be patient. Don't ask me. These people are here. But seriously, it does affect people mentally when they're alone. People uh, are built to have love. People are built to have fellowship. And it's on um, pretty much everything. I think we're pretty much needy, aren't we? 
His name alone answers the question, who made God? Well, the answer is in his name, as I said, if he is self-existent. Genesis 21.33 says, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called upon the name of the Lord, the eternal God. Exodus 3.13 says, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers, who sent me to you? And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus, you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now the name I am in Hebrew is Hayah. And the name uh, Yahweh is believed to come from this Hebrew word, Ayah, which means he causes to be. So when he was in Hebrew, it just sounds so much better than I am, right? When you hear the name I am, it's like, what does that actually mean, you know? Uh, his, that, the name I am that actually literally means he causes to be, or he causes to exist, or he creates. John G. Butler uh, says, the idea expressed by the name I am is that of real, perfect, unconditioned, independent existence. As such, the name plainly and forcefully states that Yahweh is sovereign, self-existent, eternally existing, immutable, and all-powerful. It means that there is no equal to Yahweh. He is above all. Thus, this name sets Israel's God apart from other gods. He is a God who is very, very compassionate, yet he is a God, he's very compassionate and intimate, yet he is a God who is very distant with his creation. What? Now how can you be, you know, intimate? How can you be compassionate with your creation, yet distant? Well, I'll explain. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 40 says, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him. And he said, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy had left him, and he was cleansed. Now, if you know anything about the Word of God, you know the Lord Jesus was not supposed to do this. Why? Well, Leviticus 5 says, Or if a person touches anything ceremonially unclean, whether the carcasses of unclean wild animals, or of unclean livestock, or of unclean creatures that move along the ground, even though he is unaware of it, he has become unclean and is guilty. Or he touches human uncleanliness, anything that would make him unclean, even though he is aware, unaware of it, when he learns of it, he will be guilty. So the law states clear right here that a person who touches someone who is undefiled, this person was supposed to be banished from the camp for seven days. Yet, get this, when Christ touched the leper, he, according to the law, contacted the defilement of the leper, right? That's why he was supposed to leave. But the contact was done to bring healing to the leper. This is a beautiful picture of salvation, and it reminds us of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, which says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, what we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ became sin for us that he might save us. So by the way, when Christ was crucified, he was taken out of the city, like the scapegoat was supposed to be taken out of the city, and like a person who was defiled. Today we come to God literally, spiritually leprous. With all our mistakes, with all our doubt, with all our sin, he cleanses us, he forgives us of all our mistakes. He forgives us of all our sins, and when we humble ourselves before God and ask for forgiveness, he just forgives us. Amen? Okay, so you're thinking, I, I get the compassion part, but what about this distant part you're talking about? Well, when I'm talking about a distant part, I'm not talking about emotional distance. Um, God is never emotionally distant. One time I tweeted on uh, Twitter, things you will never hear the Lord say, such as, things are getting too serious between us. I think we need a break from each other. I'm confused right now, and I'm not over my last relationship. Can you imagine coming to God and him telling you this? Things, uh, 
I just think we should start seeing other people. I just need some space. And the killer of them all, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> Can you imagine going to God and him being emotionally unavailable to you? It just doesn't happen. He's God. That's us. We're emotionally unavailable. Okay, those are the excuses that we come up with. Exodus 3, uh, verse 5 says, Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Leviticus 16 says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place. Behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die. Because I appear in the cloud over the atonement. You see, we have to be, God is distant from us because of our sin. But he doesn't want that distance. What we have to remember is we have to be reverent in his presence. And that's why what I mean by God being distant. Exodus 33, 20 says, But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Can you imagine? God is so holy that if sinful me would look upon his face, I would die. Because he is so holy. We just can't comprehend that. It's just something that our minds cannot uh, grasp at all. Did you know... You can learn more about God by what he has created in his creation. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Amen? So the key word here is craftsmanship. Because in someone's craftsmanship, you see personality. In God's personality, can be seen throughout his entire creation. In 1996, there was a band called Three Crosses. Uh, Sam and I were talking before the service of Christian music. We're like, I've always been a fan more of the Christian uh, rock music. And this band called Three Crosses um, came out with a song, and it was called uh, Michelangelo. And in the song, he says, try to count the colors in a California sunset. Try to imagine the colors of the leaves in a New England fall. You see that. God painted better than Michelangelo. God painted better than Pablo Picasso. And not only has it was that a catchy tune, but it reminded me instantly of Romans chapter 1, verse 20, which says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Amen. So the song Michelangelo reminded me of Romans 120 because what the singer is actually saying was not only did God paint better than Michelangelo and Picasso, but you can see that there is a huge, and I mean a huge difference between the beauty that God puts in when he builds something than when we make something. The uniqueness of God is seen in the uniqueness of his creation. If I put a Michelangelo painting in front of you, and then a Picasso, you would notice a vast difference in the two. Why is that? Well, that's because Michelangelo and Picasso totally put their personalities into their paintings. There truly is a huge difference because of their personality, their soul, uh, their talents, and their gifts that they put into it. And there is a string of similarities in all of Michelangelo's work. Just like there's a string of similarities in all of Picasso's work. Um, if, if you look at Picasso, which is on the right, that's not a Michelangelo. And if I showed you that and I told you, hey, look, this is a Michelangelo, you'd be like, no, 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 no. That's a Picasso. Well, why do you know? Because that's how he did his paintings. The same thing with Michelangelo, which is when he made some beautiful statues out of marble. Uh, that, that was him. That was the gift that God gave him. That was what he put into it, his personality. And that's what makes it unique. Because you see, if I tried to do that, even if I was a gifted painter, I wouldn't come up with that face. That's in his mind, you see. So have you ever seen a brontosaurus? Have you ever seen a giraffe? Right? 
Have you ever seen a pterodactyl, the wing structure of the pterodactyl, and the golden giant crown fox bat, which I believe is only in Australia, I think? It's giant, it comes down and it picks little people up, and flies away with them. No, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. Why is it So, you know, these animals and others don't have similarities because of evolution. These animals have a string of similarities because they come from the same mind. Amen. The Creator's mind, God's mind. That being said, God's ways and why He does things or even allows things, sometimes, you know, why do things happen in our lives, is not something that we can understand or explain. It's like when I, I'm asked if God is so powerful and can do anything, then why didn't He just make everything in one day? People ask me that a lot. You know, why does it take God, who's all-powerful and almighty, seven days? Well, honestly, there could be many reasons. Isaiah 55, uh, verse 8 says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I'll give you an example. When the Lord told Sarah, you're going to have a child, Isaac, and he told Abraham. He told them, and they didn't have a child for 25 years. But he told them they were going to have a kid. Why didn't he just give them a kid right away, right there? It's the same thing with uh, the Lord Jesus and Lazarus. Why didn't the Lord Jesus do like what he did with the centurion and said, go, your brother is healed, right, right at this moment? He didn't do that. What he did was he waited not only two days, but then he knew there was a trip to take two days to get to Lazarus. So by the time the Lord Jesus got to him, it was four days. Now, they have a, a Jewish tradition that the dead, uh, you know, always hang around. The Jewish tradition is that the soul hangs around the body for three days. Maybe the Lord Jesus knew that, and that's why. Or maybe he just wanted the miracle to be a miracle that people like, wow, you're dead four days, forget it, you know? But I always pictured somebody like, uh, you remember the Princess Bride, Miracle Max, you know? I always pictured somebody like him going, it just so happens he was only mostly dead. Not all dead. Okay? There's a difference in mostly dead. He's slightly alive. All dead, there's only one thing you can do. Go through his pockets and look for change. Okay? That's what they probably would come up with an excuse like that. Of course, you know, he was only three days dead. His soul was still by his body. So it was an even greater miracle that the Lord Jesus did that. Well, whatever the Lord's reasons is, the creation of the universe was no small feat. You see, you have to understand the vastness, the complexity of God's creation is astonishing. When we speak of God, you speak of his creation. The answer uh, and, uh, uh, is the same for both. They, incredibly, they are both incredibly beautiful, incredibly complicated, incredibly original, and incredibly unique. I don't think when people ask that question, though, that they really, truly understand how hard and how vast and how giant God's creation is. Um, Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Can you imagine that? When God created the universe in the beginning, it was by the breath of his mouth. And I always pictured that to be, you know, like in the wintertime when you're talking to somebody and you can see the steam or the mist coming out of your mouth? That's how I always pictured that. And he's like, let the stars be born. And you just see it going out, out, creation starting to form. I just think that's cool. You know? The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. It says, if breathe the word and all the stars were born. Uh, Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. Now check this out. Get this verse, the last part here. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Do you, do you, you get that? By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen, so everything that you can see, it was made from things that are not visible. Well, what are those things? Well, the Bible's telling us right there. Matter, atoms, subatomic particles. That's what our whole matter that we can see is made out of. 
And the Bible tells us plainly right there. Isaiah 40, 26 says, Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name because of his great power, the incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Now, I want to give you an idea to show you exactly what God did and how awesome God is. Because we really don't, we, we hear about creation, but we really don't really grasp it. I just want to show you how big his creation actually is. This is the Earth, okay? And that's the planet Venus. Look how big Mars is compared to the Earth, Mercury, and Pluto. Now, the Earth is 25,000 miles in circumference. It weighs six septillion, 586 trillion tons. It hangs unsupported in space. Amen, I got an amen from him. I got an amen. Uh, it spins a thousand miles per hour with absolute precision and careens through space around the sun at the speed of a thousand miles per minute in an orbit of 580 miles long. Okay? Uh, the Earth is the only planet in our solar system that does not have an elliptical orbit, but a circular orbit. It stays 93 million miles away from the sun, helping maintain our temperature and help us sustain life. Of course, the Earth has well, like 78% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, get all science on you now, other gases and water. Sigmund Bowers, though, a scientist, said, uh, the odds of this happening by random chance is one in a hundred trillion trillion that this planet would be created as perfect as it is. The other planets in our inner solar system protect the Earth from asteroids and, and the asteroid belt. Now the next picture shows you, look at the size of Earth now on the far right there. This is Earth, you see that right? This is the Earth right there, you see right here? This is what our Earth looks like, right there, compared to Jupiter. And notice, Jupiter doesn't have uh, its rings. It's missing its rings. That's how big the Earth is compared to Jupiter and Saturn. By the way, Job chapter 26, verse 7 says, and get this, he spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the Earth over nothing. Job lived about 4,000 years ago. Science wasn't invented until 3,000 to 3,500 years ago. Some say in Mesopotamia, the Egyptians. How did he know 500 years before science was invented that the earth just hangs on nothing? It's the word of God. It's inspired by God. Amen? Now this is our sun. And notice how tiny our Earth is. It's just a tiny little pixel compared. Now remember how big Jupiter was? Remember how big Jupiter was compared to our, our Earth? Look how big the sun is compared to the planet Jupiter. Dr. Guillermo Gonzalez, in Lee Strobel's book, A Case for the Creator, says, if the sun was moved 5%, either way, there would be disaster. But because the sun is a yellow dwarf star and not red, it gives off the right amount of ultraviolet radiation. It is the right mass, gives off the right balance of red and blue light. And in 1993, it was discovered that the moon stabilizes the tilt of the Earth at 23.5 degrees. It wasn't until 1993 they discovered that. The moon's large size compared to other planets is unique. If the moon were too large, it would cause much too much strong tide problems. The moon also slows down the Earth in its rotation. Now let's look at the sun compared to other suns. You can see our sun on the far left there, that tiny little thing. That's what our sun looks like next to Pollux and Arcturus. And let's kick it up another notch. This is what now <laughs> Arcturus looks like compared to Betelgeuse and Antares. It's somewhere like right here. This is where, this is our sun, it's a pixel. It's right there compared to those other suns that God has created in the galaxy. Now let's look at our galaxy. This is our galaxy and where it lies in our galaxy. And our galaxy, notice where the Earth is, it's not in the center. 
It's like right there on the edge there. Uh, in 1924, astronomy, uh, astronomer Edward Hubble discovered something. You see, at one time they thought this was the universe. This is not the universe. This is just our galaxy. And it's called the Milky Way. And uh, it's called the Milky Way because in the Latin, it's uh, via lactea, it means the road of milk. It's funny. <laughs> Yes, can I have some cookies, please? I'm going on a road of milk. I'm going to get my milk and my cookies. Scientists estimate that our galaxy alone is about 100,000 light years long. And there's about 100,000 million stars and about 100 billion planets. To give you an even better idea of how our galaxy works, uh, let's just have Star Trek help us out here for a second. Faith, the final frontier. <laughs> These are the voyages of Stony Brook Christian Assembly. Right. It's 2,500 year mission to explore strange new countries, to seek out new sinners and pagan civilizations, to boldly go where no church has gone before. Starring Pastor Reed as Captain Kirk. <laughs> Paul as Bones. <laughs> Brett Carey as Mr. Scott. <laughs> and Pastor Martin as Mr. Spock. <laughs> okay, that's not that. Now, <laughs> this is our galaxy according to Star Trek. And, you know, science fiction is rooted in science. So we can use this. If you look, our Earth is the circle red on the bottom. And there was a ship called Voyager that got lost in our galaxy. The Delta Quadrant on the very top there on the right, which is circled there. And that's where the USS Voyager was lost. Now, to give you an idea of how big our galaxy is, they are 70,000 light years away from Earth there. And in Star Trek, if you know Star Trek, you're a fan, you know that they had an engine called Warp Speed. Warp 1 in Star Trek uh, is equal to one light year, which means in Warp 1, you can travel at uh, 186,000 miles a second. That's Warp 1, okay? Now, if you have the ability, like their ships, to go a maximum of not Warp 9.9, that would be 4 billion miles per second. You can travel. It would still take you to get from Earth to Voyager 75 years at that speed. That's how big our galaxy is. Yet, our galaxy isn't the biggest galaxy. This is our galaxy compared to other galaxies. This is our galaxy on the far left there. You see that's our galaxy compared to that large galaxy there, M87 it's called. And if the universe is expanding, astronomers uh, say uh, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope found that not only is the universe still expanding, but the universe is expanding 5 to 9% faster than they expected. This next picture right here, look at our galaxy now on the bottom left there. We're a pixel again. And this is the galaxy IC 1011. How big that galaxy is. And finally, I hope I bored you enough with science here. The last picture is, look at how beautiful these stars are, you would think. Now, this is taken, this is an actual photo from the Hubble telescope. These are actually, literally, galaxies, not stars. Wow. Now, when somebody asks, why can't God be so powerful creating all this in one day, you get a better idea if you see how vast and how ginormous our galaxy and our universe actually is. I hope you, you, by seeing the universe in this way, it gives you a glimpse of his power, his knowledge, and his wisdom. I hope you see also that not only did God make the universe unique and special, but he made his greatest cre creation unique and special here on earth, which is you. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power. He created everything for himself, church. 
J. Vernon uh, McGee said that if you have wondered why a certain tree has a certain kind of leaf, it's because that is the way he wanted it. It was made by him, and it was made for him. Isaiah 43, 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. So we can see that God has formed us. He has made us his most important creation for his glory. That's why we're so unique. Ephesians 12, 10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You see, because we are God's masterpiece, and Satan tried to destroy God's masterpiece, he couldn't let somebody else destroy his painting. He couldn't allow somebody else to destroy his sculpture of his most prized creation. So what did he do? He redeems us through Christ on the cross. He redeems us and saves us. He created us for his glory, and God's reason for restoring his people to display his glory. Because God saved his grace, his people became living proof of his glory. Satan thought by introducing sin, God's plan from the beginning would be stopped. He forgot something, though. Isaiah 55, 11. It is the same with my word. I send it out. And it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Once God's word goes out, nothing can stop it. Amen. When he breathed and said to me, the star to be created, no devil in hell can stop it. Mm-hmm. And I want you to know, church, when you talk to our God, this God who created all this universe, he hears your prayer. Mm-hmm. He'll answer your prayer. And know there is nothing he did all of this, there is nothing too hard for our God. Amen? Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We ask, Lord God, that you just continue to use us, Lord. Continue to build us, Lord. Continue to strengthen our faith. To continue to help us, Lord, in our walk. Let your word continue to build in our hearts, Lord, to be that foundation, to be that fire in our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you will always be by our side that we will always be remembering, Lord, that your kingdom is the most important thing. And you put us here for your glory. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Uh, Thanks for coming out. And have a great Sunday. Amen.